Yo, what's up, people? It's the Solar Kid, and welcome back to my channel, The Other Side of the Sun Podcast. And today I have Pablo Imani. Did I pronounce that right, bro? Yeah, yeah. Pablo Imani is an African yoga instructor. He's also an author, a therapist, holistic health, and you've trained in kinesiology as well. I mean, yeah. you've obviously done a lot of work around the body and, and well being. And, and yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I found, uh, uh, I found you. I actually, I've, I've, um, I've been following you for quite a few years. I'd say a, a long time, like almost up to, say, like eight years or something. Oh, I've, wow. never, um, I've never wow. had the opportunity to actually meet you. I've known about you through different circles. Yeah. And um, I've always been intrigued by African yoga because I, um, I kind of started my yoga journey in about 2009 or 10 um, and started practicing and, you know, just figuring out, finding my way. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I've always been interested in it and then developing my own practice over time and like, um, you know, obviously reading and, and learning about the philosophy behind it and stuff. So African yeah. yoga was always intriguing, being African myself, you know, and like wanting <laughs> to have like some connection to where I come from rather than yes, yes. I'm not saying rather than because the, the knowledge and information gained from traditional yoga or you know from India is um, is just as, as valid I'd say you know in, in terms of my development and growth and, mm -hmm. and that's why I was I'm, I'm so happy that we finally connected on this level so that I can speak to you you know face to face and ask you firsthand like you know um about this thing all the questions that you wanted to ask. No, no, yeah exactly so um i'll wow, start by yeah. just uh maybe if you can just give me like a or give us a background on on you and who you are and how you got into this, this thing. okay all right well basically my background um i said would be in martial arts so okay. i kind of like you know took myself to martial arts when i was like 12 years old um and and that's uh, i went to i went to mai tai okay um, wow that's the yeah. i trained with master toddy who is still training today and i trained with him um he's the person that brought mai tai to the uk so i kind of like at 12 i just like took my pocket money and I went and trained, I started training with Master Toddy and I trained with him for about six years. Um, and, um, and then I just kind of like dabbled with dance. Um, <clears throat> I got introduced to yoga when I was about 19. Okay. And, and um, which is over 30 years now. So I got I got introduced to yoga and it was like my older brother's um, girlfriend who basically was a yoga teacher. Was this um, in the same period or later on? It was it was a bit later on because she was like, oh, you're so supple, come on. You know, <laughs> let me show you some stuff because I was into dance and everything. So I was like, I was like wanting to stretch all the time. The martial arts, um, especially doing Mai Tai, it gave me that discipline. It was this in London that. or? Because I mean, I, I detect a- No, oh, actually it wasn't London. I was raised in the north of the country. So I was raised in Manchester. Okay, yeah, I can detect a northern accent. Yeah, you yeah. hear it, right? So I was raised, I was raised in Gunchester. Or, or north, of, yeah, north of the country, and actually, um, I I got into a lot of fights at school, so um, I wasn't great at fighting. So I, that's when I took myself to martial arts, um, literally. And and it wasn't it wasn't like I could go to my parents and say, hey, you know, this is happening at school, because I was like. Um, I guess I was experiencing, I got into those fights because I was just different. You know, I was just a little kid, um, African Caribbean, and I was the only like African Caribbean youth in my, in my, not in my entire school. I think there was about four of us, <laughs> but, but in my class, certainly all the way up in, into, so as soon as I got into secondary school, I got into fights all the time. 
And, and because of that, I took myself to martial arts. And of course that gave me the discipline to um, stretch, take care of my body. Um, I, I, there's a side of me that enjoyed the violence of it somehow. So, you know, um, um, I was really into it. So when I got introduced to yoga, because I, I stopped doing it when I was about 18, um, that's my tie. Um, I had an injury, so I kind of like was happy to, to be introduced to some yoga to help me with my stretches, you know, to continue with somehow keeping my body. Because now I'm addicted to stretching. It's not, it's not something that I cannot stop doing. I'm now addicted to it. So um, doing the yoga, but I didn't think it was for me at the time. I mean, I'm from the streets. I come from a gang culture, you know, <laughs> gang background, and yoga is not something that I would talk about with my friends, you know, yeah. it's not just something that we would say. And there was no one that looked like me that did yoga. So I kind of um, kept it up behind closed doors, stretching and everything. I also got um, uh, arts to go to a rehearsal, no, it's not, it's not, an audition for dance, uh, for a dance school, um, because a lady saw me in the theater and um, I was stretching at the interval. And she was like, oh, you know, you're, you're kind of supple, you know, um, you fancy joining this dance thing. And I was always interested in dance because, uh, you know, I used to hang out with break dancers at the time, you know, so, um, yeah, yeah. So I just, I just, I just went to the dance audition, and I, I had this thing about dancers. I always respected dancers, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I basically got in, but I didn't want to do it. Oh, maybe because you know it was, it was too much. Um, oh, darling, and all of that. Yeah, because of the old culture. And <laughs> So I'm just like, I'm just like, no, uh, no, thank you. So I went to art school instead. And, and that kind of began my journey. I kept on um, hanging out with dancers, but, um, and stretching, but, you know, it wasn't the path that I wanted to go into. So did you actually ever do like traditional um, yoga teacher training or like in, in terms of I had to yes um eventually when I decided that um this is what I'm going to do um I was basically training myself so literally I kept on my martial I, I kept on my martial arts and I had back problems and I started doing some yoga postures, about maybe four yoga postures, particularly from the Egyptian yoga master, um, Dr. Moata Ashby. And basically that problem was gone within a week. Within a week. So I was like, what is this? I need to know what this is. This is working like magic. So I decided to go into it deeply and study and study and study and study. Now, how did I get into teaching was that I was asked to um, present a sister circle. And um, they said, oh, we hear that you do yoga, Pablo. And it was a sister circle actually was in Brixton. Okay. And um, I, I just went there. I, I said to them, you know, I, I don't really know yoga. I just do my own thing. And they're like, that's okay, that's okay. It just shows what you know. And so I went there and I, I showed them what I knew and they liked it. So they invited me the next month. And then they invited me the following month after that. And then I think around about the fourth time they said, uh, the lady that was running the sister circle said, you should teach, you're pretty good. And that was my initiation into actually beginning to teach but I wasn't confident mm -hmm. and I started some classes 
um, and always developing around Africa because I had this thing about Africa. I was, I guess, another obsession, you know, really about Africa. And I was also doing African martial arts. So okay. I like also- uh, Kazimba. Um, that's right. Okay. So I believe that everything comes out of Africa, you know, science, mathematics, blah, blah, blah. you know, I was pan-Africanist in that way. Yeah. So I just went, bam, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be dealing with um, uh, Indian stuff because I don't see myself in it. So I delve more into researching into um, yoga coming out of Africa. And hence, I came across people like um, Ra Nefer Amen, who, who wrote, um, what was the books now? Um, is it 42 Laws of Ma'at and, you know, um, 11 Laws of Ma'at and other, other books. And Dr. Muata Ashby and, and a few other um, teachers, I came across those. So, so, because I was studying that, I naturally gravitated to an African type system and I was more focused on that. But however, I couldn't get insurance okay. in London at the time to teach from an African perspective. Everyone I went to um, wouldn't give me insurance. So I had to develop the system, my system, and create a whole curriculum around what I teach. And I used, I, I used the martial arts experience. I used all my kind of um, anatomy and physiology, kinesiology, um, massage training within that. And I, and I created my own system. So, so uh, you are the, so you are basically the creator of what is African yoga, yeah. So yeah. What is actually known. So there's no other. Is there no other like faction or anything similar in any way in the world, like in terms of African yoga? Um, no, um, not that I'm aware of. You know, um, there are similarities with I think other systems, but not coming out of Africa, like. Maybe something like I see over the years. I've seen things like um, Budicon, um, uh, which mixes a, a kind of like primal movement, martial art movement, and yoga. It has that kind of mix, mm -hmm. um, and maybe there may be a couple of them, but they they came a little bit later than what I'm doing. It came a little bit later, so that's interesting, man. So, like, um, so what would you say are like the main differences then between like what you've developed and traditional yoga? And... Okay, the main difference would be language, the language that is used. I mean, that is obvious because we're using um, Medinetta, we're using um, language from the Nile Valley. So that's probably one of the main difference. The other difference is, is done to the sound of drums. Um, another difference would be the rhythm, that, you know, the fact that we use uh, rhythmic movements and dance and flow. It's more, it's more like dynamic movement. Yes, yes. So, so instead of can static. Be dynamic. Can be, it can also have a little bit of static in it because of the, um aspects of doing postures but it has dance flowing movements uh which we call hudu which is done with the um working with the elements mm -hmm. so so there's the emphasis of elemental practice within um the african african yoga system and then so like um the actual postures and the, the, the philosophy, because um, 
Mm. I've trained with a few like traditional yoga teachers who are very like entrenched in the Indian system. So they all, it's so like some of the, the classes that I've been to, they would teach, um, you know, a bit more philosophy during the class where other classes are a bit more like in a gym or like in a leisure center kind of thing where it's just, you know, exercise and, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So in your, in your practice, is there any like philosophy behind the postures? Do you talk a lot of philosophy and why is it based on, is it only like Egyptian or like is, are there other African elements? That's, that's a very good question. Um, but, but there's like two, two questions. I'm sorry, really I, don't, I, don't like, I <laughs> don't like asking double barrel <laughs> questions. But I just assume but, that you'd be able to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, one is um, the philosophy. Yes, the philosophy comes out of ancient Egypt, and um, we're working with mainly um, Ma'at. Ma'at is like the moral code. So, like in the traditional systems, you have um, what is called ahimsa, which is yes. like seven violence. Yeah, non-violence, non-stealing, non subjugation of the you know um sexual whatever there's all these little um parts and also um they line up with also the wheels of the buddhist system which is called dharma yes. so they line up with that and ma'at also has you know truth justice righteousness reciprocity harmony balance and um, compassion as well as or equilibrium so um, we work with Ma'at as um, the basis of the philosophy, but also the Seti, the first philosophy, there's a, the philosophy of Tarhotep. And these are like the first philosophers in the world. So, so we work from that basis, I'm coming from that basis, and also from the oldest books in the world. So like the profound wisdom, that is taken from the pyramid text and um, what they call the pyramid and the coffin text. So we, I, I take from that basically. Okay. Um, and, and that is the guiding path of the system. Um, but there was no like, um, so in uh, traditional yoga, you have Adi Yogi or Shiva who was like the first you know yogi practicing but like um yes there, was there any of that sort of practice in ancient egypt or is it yes yes absolutely absolutely okay. and this is what i this is what i teach i mean people don't really get that in a class setting they get that when they're being trained by me so when they're doing teacher training they get all that kind of historical background um actually there is com uh it's comparable like you have Shiva in India and you have Shu in Africa. Now Shu pre predates the Shiva concept. Oh wow. So, so a lot of the philosophy of Africa predates the Indian concept. Now Shiva, if you look at Shiva, for instance, for example, it's actually not written shiva is not written in the vedas themselves yeah it's um um because the Hindu aryans who invaded um india didn't have a word for shiva they got that word over time by the indigenous people that were already living in india and they couldn't pronounce it's, it. They couldn't pronounce Shu, so it became Shiv. Ah, that's interesting. So, 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 you have Shiva and you have Shakti. Yeah. You have um, Shu and Tefnut or Shuti. Yeah. So, which is known as the twin shoes in Africa. So, um, you have the masculine and you have the feminine. And this is um, uh, one of the actually comparable parts, but most people don't do enough research to understand that or to even know that or do enough reading to know that. And most 
yogis, even who practice from an Indian perspective, Indian system, don't do enough reading or research in the background. No, I've I've, I've actually <laughs> I've realized I've I've realized that because even before I started practicing or doing yoga, I've always been interested in in history and in you know culture and world history and world culture. So I've obviously, I mean, when I started my yoga journey, I wanted to be a teacher. So I got all the, the, the yoga teacher training books and stuff like that, oh, and I started wow. reading and whatever. But I didn't actually come do go and do the training myself. I just start, I did something similar to where I kind of developed my own practice, you know, and like just kind of, but the point I was trying to make was that I've met younger yoga teachers or people that I've been in classes with because you know it's nice to go to a class sometimes and have someone yeah yeah um teach you or whatever and like i'll start asking them questions on philosophy and you know like on yogic philosophy and then they'll be like they don't know <laughs> i'm like, what? <laughs> like what? yeah what? yeah i mean guaranteed i mean they will not a lot of them don't know they you see that the, the and this is one of the issues as well that i think even not, not that has been stated by Indian gurus. Yeah, that yeah. The people in the West are somehow bastardizing their tradition. Mm -hmm. and, and some of them are, are basically taking issue with that. Obviously, some of them are more open, um, but there is yeah. not enough understanding because they're saying that traditionally it's not about your body it's not about you know having a nice slender six-pack tom <laughs> body getting rid of the big butt all that kind of stuff it's not it's but it's not about that it, it it was about here it was about your spirit it was about the development of your energy and the connection to source the connection to uh, being aligned with all things and having awareness and consciousness, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what the practice was about. And that's why, you, you know, when you go back into the Indian system, like um, they like to talk about Patanjali. So when you go yep. back to Patanjali, yeah, yeah. there was only 15 postures, not I don't well, there know, are a million postures in that like book, though. <laughs> thousand postures now, or something like that. There, there's, there was only 15. And the main and most important posture was what we're doing, which is sitting down. That was the most important posture. And why do you want to sit down and be still, you know? Um, so all the other postures came about to give the body enough strength enough physical strength to sit down for like three hours or whatever it is or four hours just in meditation without without um saying oh i'm, I'm hurting here i'm hurting there but giving you the physical strength and discipline to be able to do that for long periods of time it's funny you you mentioned that um patanjali because when i when i actually read it I got to the part where like all the passage were and I was like, okay, I'll take the philosophy and I'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll stick to like the basic part because there was like just way too many postures. I was like, no, okay, no, I don't. I mean, like, you know, I enjoy it and like I'm using it for a specific purpose, like for my meditation. And, <laughs> right. like, I'm not going to be spending my life learning all these different, different postures. <laughs> right, right. Oh man. So, I mean, I mean, that's primarily one of the main differences. I mean, um, you, I mean, there's, there's, there's only a few differences. There actually is a lot of similarities with that um, African system and the Indian system. Lots, so, so much similarity. Everything that the Indian system says um, it can do for you, the African system can also do for you so it you know about the development of the body the development of the mind and of yeah let's, let's get into that i mean that was going to be my next question is um what are the benefits you know what are the benefits of uh, 
the, well, the general benefits is um, flexibility, greater flexibility, um, more strength in the body, uh, you know, more tone, more alignment, in, in particular with um, uh, yourself, your inner self. Because a lot of people like to talk about, you know, especially from an African perspective, we like to talk about the ancestors, we like to talk about the, the Nitiru, the, you know, and, and a lot of people think that we're kind of like so pagan and so um, into gods and goddesses and so religious, but really what it is, is that it's about the alignment of our higher self. And our higher self actually is all those things because all those things are, um, archetypes of our own psyche and and that's why I don't teach so much about gods and goddesses I know that other teachers do especially from the Nile Valley they do mention gods and goddesses movement of the gods and goddesses etc but I talk about the cosmic forces of nature which reside within you and outside of you and it's about tuning into that and going back to source and that is really the um the benefit of it it also makes you calmer mm. you know it just makes you more aware of yourself and and calmer and you know it's it's a ongoing journey you know it's constant so are you um do you follow any particular like religious practice or are you spiritual or like do you follow any in, in, I, I would say in the past that I've done uh, I've been initiated into various religious practices so in the past I was initiated into Islam and I, 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 I practice Sufism so I was a Sufi um, also been initiated into like um, not so much a religious system, but an Egyptian order. So um, followed Kemetic type practices. Also um, um, got involved with Santeria as well. Okay. So, Santeria so is um... it's basically it's basically the the Cuban yes okay now Cuban, Cuba, uh, Cuban system. Of the Orishas um, and of the Orishas, etc., of the Ifa, or, or yeah, Shango so and, um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you know, I did that for a little while, but I also realized that a lot of religious systems um, somehow they operate from a sense of fear. They use fear. They use guilt. They use shame, most religious systems. And, you know, we're shifting. At maybe at one time that was, um, you know, for a period of time that might be necessary for humanity, but we're shifting. And we're, we're shifting into a space where it's, it's not about any of those things at all. It's about compassion. It's about openness. It's about working with your heart. It's about operating from a sense of um, courage and being more free. The knowledge that we once said was sacred is not that so much anymore. It's about everyone knowing, um, being more open. So everyone being having a sense of awareness. It's not about like um, a few people having all this information, etc. <laughs> you know, the inner, the inner temple, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so now that temple is not outside of yourself. The temple actually has all, always been inside of yourself. It's just that um, when you approach things religiously, you tend to misinterpret and take on literally um, what the ancient masters was telling us all along. So that's um, actually that, a good um, segue into my next question, actually. <laughs> okay. You mentioned the word master, and um, I was going to ask so, 
do you follow any gurus or masters or um, another double barrel question like do you follow any gurus or masters and do you do you feel they're beneficial or what what are the benefits of having it it's a very very good question um i don't particularly follow um any gurus or masters but, but i've had them okay so i went through a period in my life where i needed to have a teacher you know um someone who would either guide me or someone who would just provide information which is some of the teachers did some teachers i met um some teachers i was close with and some teachers i never met at all they taught me from their books you know yeah. um they taught me from from their lectures you know and i i honor them um in particular so i have an honor for these particular teachers but as for following them no um i learned a, a long time ago that you are your own particular teacher your, your own master and each master actually tells you that mm -hmm. a a good master will always tell you that um they're not here for you to follow them. They're actually here for you um, to, to show you the door, as, as they say, yeah? It's a proverbial saying, you know, we show you the door or, or the master shows you the door and it's up to you to walk through it, you know? So, no, um, it, in short, in answer to your question, no. Are they beneficial? I would say yes, I mean, of course they are, because anyone who um, speaks up on a particular subject in terms of um, sharing wisdom, sharing, um, I would say profound universal wisdom, which actually a lot of um, people are here on the planet to do, then of course that's beneficial because some people just don't um, somehow they're, they're, they're being blocked and literally being blocked. So there's, there's a, a, a great number of people on the planet that are literally being blocked from seeing what is there all along. And that could be through their own upbringing, their own parents, the adults around them, um, schools, uh, education system, yeah, um, media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Environment, okay. yeah. I mean, I think that was one of the biggest uh, realizations for me was the knowledge that you are the master, that you are essentially God. And I mean, that that is like controversial in, you know, it's a controversial statement, especially to a lot of like, fundamentally re like religious people you know and i come from yeah. i come from a background where like in south africa um where i grew up it's muslim and christian we live side by side but yeah. it's still very religiously fundamental and so there's lots of clashing and also very like lots of pride about your way and religion as well yeah and um for me like i've just i've 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 come to that same understanding through reading all these texts and books. And I mean, like when I was very young, when I was much younger, like in my early twenties, I read the Bible a couple of times, started reading a bit of like the Quran, went into like Rastafarianism, Taoism. Yeah. And that actually helped me to, to realize that, yo, these people are just saying to you, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm not saying that, you know, <laughs> like, this is what you, you know, that you are basically um, the one that needs to basically find this for yourself and realize that that God, like, you know, Jesus always said that, you know, you can perform these same, these same, right. miracles and, you know, absolutely. Same yeah, yeah. And yet people, I feel like sometimes we're a bit lazy because it's like, I don't really want to do that. I'd rather follow Pablo and do what he's doing. And then hopefully I'll get to, to heaven that way. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, yeah, I mean, oh. the, no, I mean, and that's the thing. And, and also teachers, teachers who are teaching, they realize that other people also, people who kind of put them on a pedestal, 
um, realize they realize that they're also these people are using them as the bridge, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and they have to find the bridge. Oh, yes, yeah, like, can I just touch your cloth, you know, and hopefully I'll be here. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, um, and and it, it, it's it's a very precarious situation for a teacher because one, it can go directly to their heads and it can blow them up and then they kind of, they can lose their way with that, um, the ego, etc., etc. Uh, we've all got ego, so we've all, um, it's, it's, you know, the ego is always constantly working with us, trying to trick us into um, not progressing, not, not breaking that ceiling. You know, so um, yeah, even for the teacher, even for the master, even for the guru, it's it's a, the the it's about the balance, and that's why we keep going back to the wisdom text. You know, that speaks about how we should um, be balanced, how we should be um, uh, more more aware, or how we should understand the real from the unreal because that veil is always, always there on this particular planet in this dimension. So we have to work through it constantly. Every individual, doesn't matter what level of consciousness you're on, it, it's about you working through that. Even, even, I don't know, when people talk about mindfulness, they immediately think about the, the Buddha, right? So they, they, they're like, well, even the Buddha, had to constantly be on it, do you know what I mean? On his game, so to speak, so that he doesn't slip because there will be people keep coming to him, questioning him, asking him things. And, you know, he had to be always on that middle path, not on one side or the other, but on the middle path, you know, so. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh... That's something I've been grappling with personally um, in the last couple of months. It's like when I when I'm in a flow um, of you know every morning like morning devotion, morning meditation, eating good, looking after my body, looking after my health, work, whatever, family balance, everything. I'm feeling amazing, um, but it's so easy to slip into like a, a, a old bad habit or like an old bad habit of doing things or things that I've done progressively over the years. And that is probably a part of me or like, I'll go back and I'll, I'll maybe start smoking a bit again or I'll like, you know, and then because I'm maybe smoking, I'm not talking about cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, you know, because I'm doing that, I'll, I'll wake up a bit later. Or I, I don't want to get up to do my morning, morning, my morning meditations. And then because of that, maybe I'll, just eat a bit more junk food and then like go through like a week or two. And then it's like, you, you, you've grown to this consciousness of being aware of it and understanding that, you know, you, your, your body is moving out of balance now. And like the thing that I've, I'm not, I mean, I'm not good at any, I wouldn't say I'm good at anything, but like, I generally always bring myself back to, you know, my, you know, the, 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 the routine that I want to be in of, you know, meditation and eating better and doing things. And because, I mean, all those things affect your mood, what you eat, how you do. Yeah. But the question, what I'm trying to say is like, why is it, it's so easy or satisfying sometimes to just like be defined. And I've always been a rebel. Like I'm a musician, I'm a, I'm a producer. I'm an mm. artist. And like growing up, I've always challenged the system. I've always been fight the power. I've always been, you know, mm. just, just a rebel you know what i mean so like in the same sense it, it happens when you 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 become a rebel to your consciousness or your your you know like your your like you know the the, the analogy of two wolves you know what i mean you feel yeah. the darker one a bit more and like yeah, sometimes yeah. i'll actually i'll enjoy doing that like i'll enjoy just being like you know fuck this like oh, i just i just want to yeah. like i just don't feel like waking up and doing my yoga today i just want to sleep in or i just want to eat some junk food today i would say i would say do it no i mean personally me for me is sometimes you have to feed those demons because um uh, as long as you're doing it consciously like you you know 
you have a, a, a conscious awareness of this is what is happening. You're not judging yourself for doing it, but you're doing it with conscious thought and awareness, knowing one is for a time. It's, it's a cycle. You going through whatever, I won't say a phase, but you're going through a cycle. And that's what happens in life. Life is full of cycles. It's full of ups and downs. It's full of these, um, that's what the journey is about, isn't it? I mean, the journey is not one straight path. It's, it's actually twists, turns around, up, down, etc. cetera. Um, it reminded me of, um, uh, I had a, I spoke to a Krishna monk like quite a few episodes ago on my podcast as well. And literally he said something exactly the same because I, I probably, I think maybe I obviously go through <laughs> cycles all the time. But, we all do, no, but he said, he said um, as long as you keep, because uh, he used Krishna as, as the, you know. Yes. You know, as, the, as he's like, if you're going to be doing a drug deal, make sure Krishna is with you, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> he looked, I mean, he, he's from chicago detroit so he's like being a krishna monk in like right you know in the wood kind of thing but um yeah but yeah no, I think I mean, judgment I mean, like that, that that annoys me not annoys me but like that that plays on my mind is like why are you falling into the same cycle again or like why are you doing you know the same thing again yeah i mean the one of the one of the 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 true issues that we have as uh people and as a society is judgment the things that the things that we view as um, horrible and wrong to us cannot be for somebody else but it's about that person's consciousness you don't know what that person's consciousness is or where that person is at um if you don't like it you stay away from it if you you know, it, it, you, you, make, you make a choice. You don't put the responsibility onto someone else. Your choice is your choice. It's the same thing like um, uh, you got children, right? And, and you're, you know, being a father or being a mother. And that, that father or mother is constantly trying to get the child to be this perfect being that doesn't make any mistakes or can't make no mistakes or <laughs> can't slip up of course they can slip up and this can slip up lots and lots of times and the idea is that it's best to be a witness than than to be this um tyrannical dictator trying to get this you know because then again, that's that's where you got to understand the whole thing is about your ego, our egos. So it's it's our egos that look for conflict. It's our egos that judge. It's our egos that are seeking to control. Eliminate those particular things and you're going to find that the relationship, parent and child, etc., is much better. The relationship with other people is much better. Um, and the whole planet as a whole could be even more beautiful. But if we aim to focus on eliminating those things from ourselves, and, and that is, and so then we have to work with ourselves because um, the first teacher and student is you. And that's, that's what it is. You are your master. You are also your student. I think with me and like, especially with, with my kids and that I always try to, um, and actually not just with my kids, with, with any kids in general, I always try and remember what I was like at those ages. Yeah, and yeah. I always try, because I was a bad kid. Well, not like bad, bad, but I Listen, was- Listen, I was, I was worse than my children. They don't know, I mean- <laughs> <laughs> when when my children do st when my children did stuff when they were really small, I mean they're grown up, but when they were doing stuff, I was just like, I'd, yeah, you know, I would be like, mm. but they just don't know 
how bad I was. <laughs> <laughs> They're really good. <laughs> They're really good. And, and you know, um, my mom used to say, you know, because um, I come from a, a Jamaican background. Um, my family line, when I trace it back, goes back to Mali. Oh, wow. wow. And my tribe is Tuareg. Okay. But, but um, my mom used to always say, market 10. Mark, every time I did something, market 10, market 10. And it was like, she was cursing me, you know? It was like, what she meant was, was that when you have your children, they're going to come at you 10 times more than how I'm coming at her. So, so, so she said, market 10. You know, every time I did yeah. something wrong, my own. <laughs> so, so, so it was, it, you know, but not actually, actually very blessed. My children was not, uh, didn't give me, did not give me hardly any trouble compared to how I, how I was. So, yeah. All right, let's move on to this. Um, I've got I, I, I have to say this primarily, primarily, um, even though I, I did have a sense of discipline, I did not try to fully control them. Okay. I understood that they were their own people mm-hmm. and they're here for their own reasons, yeah, on this planet. Yeah, no, I get, I completely get that. And I mean, I'm, my kids are still quite young, but I'm trying to, you know, adopt the same philosophy, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of just understanding that they are not me, you know what I mean? And they, they won't have the same dreams or aspirations that I have. You know, obviously there's a level of parenting that needs to be done in terms of, you know, if they step out of line or behavior or whatever, but like, you know, still just, just giving them the freedom to express and, and um, you know, find themselves, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I fully get that, man. Um, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna say when I, and then I'll, I'll add a word and then you fill in the, the rest of the sentence, yeah? Okay. So when I wake up in the morning? I go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I drink water and then I go and meditate. Okay, when I feel demotivated? I uh, take rest. I sleep or I exercise or I go for a walk, a very long, long walk. I find me some woods and I go into those woods and I sit amongst the trees and I stay there for a little while just sitting amongst the trees and I ask for guidance. I remember that. Or I listen to some uplifting um, talk or lecture by one of the like someone I don't know, not not Alan Watts, but I like. um, Oh man, what's his name? But a couple of people. I'll listen to some people who like some uplifting uh, express um, who, who remind me of of the fact that we are eternal beings and that we're that we're um we're infinite and you know i listen to things like that okay um when i feel angry when i feel angry i breathe um and uh i begin to slow myself down and I go to the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I go to the woods or go for a long walk and walk it off. I go to water. I find myself wherever there's water, either it's a lake or a stream or a canal somewhere. And I sit there um, and the water calms me down. Yeah, and the uh, last one. When I find myself in a sticky situation. Find myself in a sticky situation. <laughs> um, I find myself in a sticky situation that I try to take um, myself out of my body, actually. 
and have an overview, a look at look at the situation. So I try and do this thing where um, I become my own drone. So I just pull myself out of my body and look around and see what is happening in that situation. And then I can make a decision. That is dope. Pablo, thank you so much, man. Um, like, uh, I think you've answered like so many of my questions and I'm sure my viewers and um, will all benefit from this. And um, are they, are you like, do you have any plans of like expansion in terms of African yoga and the philosophy and the classes and the teaching or people obviously- Oh, wow, yeah, them? always. Yeah, um, I mean, I've, I just opened up my registration for my teacher, next teacher training, which will like, um, the registration is open. So um, there's like a preliminary kind of training before ones do hands-on training with me in May. So the hands-on training or the actual online Zoom <laughs> as it is nowadays training um, is actually in May. Okay. But but in terms of expansion, um, the book is also coming out and I'm hoping that to come out in July. However, I'm in preparation for everything to be ready by March um, and start the promotion of the book in in July uh, no not should I say in July but between March and July okay. um, continuous teacher training I have level one um, I'm looking to do level two this year um, I'm in London particularly in London and also in Kenya so I, I'm running a retreat in Kenya in Lamu Island in Kenya um, towards oh, the end wow. of the year in November and I also have level three and level four planned out for teacher training so I'm expanding because I've been teaching level one for some time for quite a few years but um, I have so much information to pass on so I have teachers already been trained and trained in level one, but there's an expansion of that to level two, level three, level four. Mm -hmm. um, and each one is um, a step into uh, more of your interdimensional self. And, and that's what the trainings is about. So level one really is about the physical practice, the doing, learning, understanding, the history, the concepts. Level two is more about, okay, introducing you to more um, postures, giving you more for your toolkit, but also understanding the resonance now behind the postures, the toning, all of that, that happens. Because I actually use tones with my postures Mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth and like level three is going more into developing your own pyramid power developing your sikkim and level four is about using that energy now to manifest and to generate and um to heal and all of that so yeah um oh. I will, um You'll send me the, um, and I'll, I'll obviously I'll provide all the links and stuff in the description of um, the podcast so people can find out more about you. And um, you are, you're doing online classes as well, so. I'll, yeah, yeah, so the online classes are ongoing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I do them twice a week, but I also want to um, develop into more meditation classes as well. And also classes specific for children and specific for men. Okay. because uh, yeah for a long time I've been campaigning for men to be more involved in yoga practice um, yeah. I think I started that campaign back in 2012 2013 and I wanted more men to be involved and more men are getting involved which is great yeah I see it man I see it so um bro if you if you have any um like final words or inspirational message or something to leave us with and then um, we, can, we can take up the time. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, um, all I would say is that um, 
keep yeah just keep seeking seeking the balance you know and keep working on the balance whatever you do um don't judge yourself most of this stuff that is going on with y'all is not your fault (laughs) 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 it's not your fault but so you know try not to take too much responsibility as well from other people's ideas and feelings about you because it's not about you it's actually about them so do not um take on so much um that you have already so try and strip away to find out what is actually you okay well thank you so much bro i really i appreciate your time so much i'll say otep otep yes <laughs> and, uh, this has been the other side of the sun podcast this is uh, pablo imani i'm the solar kid and uh, we are out